It's like, I remember once I was doing back in the day when we did offer presentations in person, I had this guy come in. Uh, he comes in with two envelopes, opens up envelope number one, and then he finishes his spiel and tells us about his clients and tells us all the content and details about his offer. And then I say, what's in the other envelope? And he's like, oh, that's a better offer in case we need it. (laughs) Well, you may as well open it up now because you, you know, you've already put your cards on the table. That's exactly what's happening. There's there's something better in that envelope. Yeah. It was so funny. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode 132 of KT Confidential, the real estate podcast. I'm Adrian Trott. This is Ariel Cormendi, who is recording off-site today. Off-site. How is it up there? Not no running water. It's okay to... I mean, I'm used to that. We typically don't have much when we're up north. It's a true cottage. So how are you bathing? Or are you not bathing? Um, uh, spottingly, but... Um, Baby wipes work by well. Myself. Yeah. Uh, no, I've just been sponge bat- bathing myself with uh, spring water. <laughs> I'm serious. I take a couple of bottles of, of water into the shower and, uh, yeah. you know, that's the trick. Nice. Well, I'm and and I took a uh, half a dip in the lake. Is it cold? Uh, it's freezing. Yeah, it's yeah. still cold. Although it's funny because in a few weeks, like two three weeks from now, it'll be warm enough to go for for a swim. It warms up pretty quick. Um, but yeah, I, I don't mind working off site. Uh, you know. Yeah, nice little, view. Little view of the lake when. Uh, when recording the podcast and having uh, having all kinds of meetings, that's the benefit of uh, having a good Wi-Fi. Oh, very nice. I'm glad you're able to join us still with the uh, hey, advances. Work doesn't of... stop, man. Just because you're off no, but it location, wasn't, off-site. It wasn't long ago that you wouldn't have been able to get any signal up there or any sort of internet. Really, I mean, maybe three to five years ago, it was very poor or not available. Well, and we talk about, uh, we've talked about it before Starlink, right? Yes. Starlink is going to change. I think it's going to change the real estate industry um, in in the country. Because if you think about the size of Ontario as an example, right? Ontario is huge. And the major metropolis areas are becoming very expensive. Um, you know, you look at Toronto and the GTA as an example. Well, if you drive two, three, four hours from, from those areas, there's a lot of very, very affordable properties. And, uh, some of them, because they're rural, don't get good Wi-Fi. And now with people being able to work virtually and create an income stream from home and working uh, that way, um, whether you're selling stuff on Spotify or, working for uh you know doing whatever now uh you can do it from your rural property as i am right now but yeah um, well we already saw it not long into covid once people started to work from home i think there are some people that did it preemptively where they said okay well i don't have to go to the office anymore i'm gonna move further away um and it'll be interesting to see how those jobs uh change once they uh, the offices do open up again but certainly uh, rural, the rural market has been, has benefited a lot over the course of the last. Well, and I think on that note, I think there's a lot of people that did do it preemptively, like last year, like May, June, July, August, um, when, when really people were like, oh man, we're in this for the long run. Uh, if you look back now, right, because now we're into almost June. If you look back year over year, the prices of those areas. Yeah. Like you look at uh, Bradford, Brantford, uh, Grimsby, Cambridge, even Kitchener, Waterloo, um, and then some of the rural areas in between. Like I know um, some of the Niagara region areas are just on fire right now. And Barrie, Barrie is seeing tons of activity. So all of these areas that 
you know, people recognize, hey, for 500 grand, I can get a lot more house by driving out an hour or whatever. Um, I think a lot of them, though, probably don't quite understand what's involved with owning a property like that. Um, a lot of, I know a few, few people that um, I've come across over the course of the last year that moved from one extreme to the other. So they went from city living in Toronto to a two, three, four, five acre property in a rural area on septic systems with a well, with a 200 foot driveway, with, you know, the land that needed to be maintained. Um, they're in for a, a big awakening. Oh, they would have experienced a good chunk of that over the winter with snow. Uh, but even now as the weather improves, they're going to start maintaining their property. Can you tell I've been wearing this shirt for the last three days? Hey, black looks good on you. It makes you look nice and slim. Or are you working out? Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah. Anyways, on to today's discussion. It's a topic of conversation I've seen in a few places from TikTok to articles online. And that is the escalation clause. What is an escalation clause? Well, we don't actually, I don't think I have ever seen one in the, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary this year in business. And I don't think in 10 years, in a decade, I've ever seen an escalation clause in any offers that were submitted to us. Have you? I was thinking about that when you mentioned it. I don't think so. I, I don't recall. If I did, it certainly wasn't one that we accepted or worked with. I certainly have never used one. I know Nor about I. them. I've read, you know, all the different types of clauses. And, and obviously, you learn that in the... Um, actually, come to think of it, I don't even know if they trained that in the RICO uh, licensing courses. I don't think so because it um, it's a relatively new concept. I mean, I don't I don't even know if they trained much in the way of clauses. I'd have to, I mean, it's been a while since we did it. Maybe very yeah, basic and stuff. The and the courses have have changed, but yeah. Um, well, the prem the premise with the escalation clause for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's <clears throat> I think it's more common in in the city, perhaps in Toronto and bigger markets, extremely competitive markets. And the premise of it is a buyer submits their offer at X amount of dollars with obviously other variable components as well. And there's a clause in it. The clause states that the buyer will pay. Um, and I'm sure there's different ways you could structure it, but a common way is the buyer will pay X amount of money higher than the highest bid. To, make it short and sweet. So basically, if they submit an offer of $1 million on a property, somebody else submits an offer of $1,050,000, and their escalation clause says they'll pay $5,000 more than the highest bid, then automatically their offer becomes $1,055,000. Now, the problem, there's a lot of problems with it that I see. Uh, one, some people think it's illegal uh, as far as RICO, the Real Estate Council of Ontario is concerned, but it is not. It is allowed, but it's a very uh, slippery slope. So you need to be cautious on either end uh, if you're using it, whether you're representing the buyer or the seller. Because as far as RICO is concerned, you are not allowed to disclose any details about an offer, uh, specifically price. But immediately, if you have an escalation clause, although you're not directly telling somebody, oh, the next, you know, the highest offer is X amount of money, you are indirectly telling them because based on the offer, your is now $5,000 higher or whatever that in incremental increase is. Correct. Now, the problem I see with it when you're representing a buyer is, you know, as with any industry, there are a lot of unethical people in this business. And the seller's agent doesn't, is not only not allowed, but they're not obligated whatsoever to disclose or show you proof that the offer existed or that the number was X amount of money higher than yours. 
Well, here's where it becomes tricky, and I'll I'll just interject a second before I forget my train of thought here. And for those that are wondering, you know, about this clause and and how it looks in a contract, this would be a clause um, added into a schedule in the agreement of purchase and sale. So much like you would with a mortgage condition or any other terms of the contract that aren't pre-printed, uh, that's where you would put it. And it could be worded in many, many different ways, like any any clause or any any terms, any conditions uh, that are added to the agreement that aren't pre-printed. You know, it's, it's the realtor that's creating these. Uh, when we go into what's called web forms uh, to create these documents, there are pre-printed clauses and conditions that you can select from, but it allows you to modify that in any way, shape, or form. So the first issue with putting a clause like this in is the competency of the person that might be entering this clause and how they modify it, right? Because as the seller or as the buyer, the onus is on the realtor that represents you to make sure that all the T's are crossed, I's are dotted, and that you're doing everything, you know, above water in a legal manner and and one that will make sure that the transaction closes properly. Um, But here's the thing. Once you start adding clauses like this, how legal Right, like if you start modifying as as a realtor, you start modifying this clause. Where does the legalities, you know, come in? Like, how legal is it? Are you are you doing things to the realtor code, right? And not only code of ethics, but is this properly worded? Can based on the Ontario governing bodies for real estate, can I do this? Uh, in the offer. And it's a big gray area right now. And there's a lot of discussions about it because of the heated market and a lot of multiple offers. But here's where it gets a little muddy for me. There's a form, uh, which is form 801 called the offer summary document. And I don't believe in this form. I think it's, it's crap. But the whole premise of this form is to quote unquote, register your offer showing that um, you know, whatever, Bob and Susan have uh, placed an offer um, and submitted an offer to the listing brokerage at such and such time. And this offer um, is irrevocable. It expires at whatever date and time. And that gets submitted to the um, listing brokerage. And the listing brokerage is required to keep one of two documents to um uh, prove essentially that that offer was received and um, shown or or reviewed with the uh, listing um, the the sellers. So here's the muddy area. If if there is a buyer that had an escalation clause and they didn't win, or even if they did win, or if there was a buyer that lost because of that escalation clause and the other offer, the only way to find out if there was no fluff in this whole process is afterward to request RICO to request those documents from the listing brokerage. Right. And and even only then, they're just going to say, or they're going to provide the knowledge of, yes, there was another offer. They, they will not disclose the pertinent deal, details of that offer. So you can never right. find out what, what are all the intricacies of the offer. Did I just get, you know, the hood pulled over my eyes and, and got smoked for an extra... 20 grand because somebody decided to take advantage. Right. Well, I mean, think of it this way too. Like obviously price is one of the great, highest, uh, the greatest variables in the offer that often drives someone's decision. Um, But it's not everything. And there have been times where um, 
representing both sides were this, you know, representing the seller, they chose a, an offer that was slightly lower on the dollar amount, but ticked a lot more boxes on other things such as closing data and better conditions. And, um, you know, and also representing buyers, we've been in that situation where our, our offer wasn't necessarily the highest, but it was the most attractive. It and it happens more often than people think that the, abs- absolutely. it's not necessarily the highest uh, the highest bid or the highest amount, uh, that, that gets accepted. Well, and representing the buyer, like, let's say you had hypothetically, you could have a situation where you have two offers. One offer is for, um, a million dollars. And, um, the other offer is for, let's just say 980, but 980 has that escalation clause in it. Okay. Now, that million dollar offer let's say hypothetically, it's the highest offer in this situation, but perhaps they had an anything but ideal closing date. So they wanted to close on a date that wasn't convenient to the seller. Now the seller may have accepted it, but it wasn't their preferred closing date. And they had a home inspection, but the $980,000 offer was firm and the perfect closing date. And for a difference of $20,000, it's realistic to think that somebody who uh, heavily weighted the closing date as a, a variable that they were taking into consideration may have accepted that offer as it stood, but now they get the they get their their the cake and to eat it too. They get the, the the ideal closing date, the perfect offer, and they get an extra whatever hypothetically five thousand dollars more than the highest bid, which wasn't perhaps in that case wasn't even necessary to pay. So in other words, in that scenario, the buyer just spent an extra 25,000 bucks for nothing. Right. And the other thing, representing the seller, first of all, I think I would cross that clause off on anything because I, I, I think it could lead and open your client up to potential litigation. It's not something that I'd want to put my clients in that position. But immediately, it tells you that there's money on the table, right? Like, all right, well, here's their offer, but they obviously can spend more money. So that's where negotiation comes into play. It's it's like, I remember once I was doing back in the day when we did offer presentations in person, I had this guy come in. I was represent, representing the seller. I had this guy come in, real estate agent. Uh, he comes in with two envelopes and he sits down, opens up envelope number one, and he goes through it. And then he finishes his spiel and tells us about his clients and tells us all the content and details about his offer. And then I say, what's in the other envelope? And he's like, Oh, that's a better offer in case we need it. (laughs) Well, you may as well open it up now because you, you know, you've already put your cards on the table. That's exactly what's happening. There's there's something better in that envelope. Yeah. It was so funny. Okay. And you could tell he's like, oh, I should not have brought this in. You could just see on the look on his face. It was so funny. Uh, But that's what you're doing. You're saying, here's my offer, but I'll pay more. You remember, it was about eight or nine years ago, maybe. And uh, you and I, it was for one of our neighbors, because we've sold a lot of homes on our street. And it was for one of our neighbors. And you and I ended up going to the offer presentation together. And there was one agent, he sat down and he had this like smug appeal to him and uh, um, very, you know, well-dressed, well-spoken, whatever. But he sits down and he uh, he presents his offer just like in your scenario. I don't know if you remember this or not. And uh, And he presents the offer and it was... I think at asking price or something like that. And, and it was just totally you know, average offer, my, the, our sellers weren't interested in that offer. And I looked at him and I said, is, is this a, you know, serious offer? Like, are you guys understanding we're on a, we're in a multiple offer situation and, and this home uh, yeah. is valued really in the market above what we were asking, even though that was setting the benchmark at that time for that model, um, you know, there was still multiple offers and everything back then. So anyways, he presented that offer. I asked him, you know, is, is this serious? And then he goes, Oh, but hang on. Here's, here's our real offer. You remember that? No. <laughs> here's yeah, our he real offer. Out, he, he, he pulls it out of his bag and he goes, well, here's our, our real offer. 
and the sellers are looking at him and like, we're all sitting at the same table yeah. and they look at me and they're like, what? And, uh, they were confused. I was confused. Like, why wouldn't yeah. you just sit down and present that offer first? If you're just going to pull it out yeah. right away. But I've, so, yeah, as, I've had a similar as thing it, happen where they faxed or sorry, scanned and emailed documents, but they had two copies of page one and one was a revised with a higher number that they didn't mean to send me just in case they needed it. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Kind of hard to believe. So you mentioned our 10 year anniversary. We should do, we should do something big this year for, for that official uh, anniversary. We don't even know what our official anniversary date is, but um, when we started, we were getting, Offers by fax. Pretty yeah. crazy to think, right? Yeah, I remember that. Um, They'd fax it to our office. Our office would scan and email it to us. Yeah. Crazy, crazy, crazy how things have changed. So if you're the seller, like if I'm the seller and I see, let's say, just two offers, and one of them has this escalation clause, it kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like I feel I feel bad for the other people. And then, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, well, what kind of a stupid clause is this? If your offer is 980, but you can go to five grand above the highest offer, well, why don't you just give me an offer with your maximum amount and and you know, let it be fair for everybody? Um, because obviously, uh, and 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 now the other part of it is. Let's just say in that scenario, 980 versus a million. And the, the clause was for 5,000 above the highest offer. In a good negotiating scenario, the listing agent might be able to get more than the million 5,000, right? Because what if that offer of a million was million 20? Now, right. Offer B is actually a million twenty-five, or you know, whatever. Some of the escalation clauses might have a cap in it, which is a whole other discussion. Because then you're just saying, "Well, this is what I can spend on the home." So again, as the seller, well, why wouldn't you give me that offer? Like, are you trying right. to screw me for money or whatever? This is market right. value. But um, I think that's something people don't understand too. From a like, there's just a lot of psychological psychological stuff going on, and you can easily piss off a seller um, by doing by what they consider playing games like that, and they may not consider your offer. Period. Sellers have in the past for us accepted a quote unquote first offer um, versus secondary or following offers because that offer was first to the table and they provided a good clean offer. The agent has been respectful. Um, you know, they versus the offer made, that came up 10,000, then another 10,000 and another 10 and maybe ended up five higher than the one you do accept, but they, they uh, played, they yes. were playing games. Specifically in that scenario, we've had many, many sellers that have accepted the offer that came in with the best foot forward right out of the bat, didn't play any games, no back and forth, didn't try to nickel and dime yeah. um, and, and all of that, even to the point where that in that scenario, the seller ends up accepting less money from the offer that didn't play any games and came, came forward right away with a good clean offer. Um, we've had that happen a lot. Yeah. Well, going back to the scenario of the million versus the 980, let's say the million dollar bid was the one with the escalation clause. And it was the ideal offer, had all the closing date, no conditions, et cetera. Without that escalation clause, I might accept it. But I know there's money on the table, so I'm sending it back. I'm going to say, listen, I'm not accepting your escalation clause. I don't like to use those. So you need to cross it off. If your client can spend more money, put your best foot forward and you'll either get it or you won't. And this is where things start getting gray because as the realtor, you have to be very cautious not to disclose terms of the other offers. So now it's a very different discussion because you're going back and you're saying, 
we need more money to do this deal. And how do you properly and legally say to that buyer's agent that they there isn't another offer that's higher than theirs, so you're not enforcing the escalation clause in that scenario. But because that clause is in there, we know that you've left money on the table and we want to sell for top dollar. So we're not accepting your million. There isn't another offer higher than yours, but we want more money. Well, you just exactly like you said it, but without saying there isn't another offer higher than yours. I mean, you know, the the value of the home is in the eyes of the buyer and you want to find the buyer that's willing to pay the most amount of money, assuming your client's on board with that. And right. um, I think it's a very easy conversation. It's, listen, you've obviously told me there's money left on the table. My client's undecided about what to, which offer to accept. Um, they definitely will not accept an offer with an escalation clause because of the potential liability or risk involved with that. So before we make a decision, send it back without the escalation clause and put a price that your client's prepared to pay. And the gray area is, imagine that buyer at 980, if you were that person, or, I mean, we flip-flopped as to which one has the escalation clause. But right. okay, so let's say the million, the 981 still has that escalation clause, the million does not. Right. And the escalation clause is for, let's make it even higher, $25,000 more than the highest offer. So you got two offers, 980 and a million. 980 has an escalation clause that increases the price 25,000 more than the other highest offer. So, so on that note, I, I think in that price range, you have to do that because I'd be inclined to give it to the person that came in with the higher offer for a difference of five grand. Oh, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I, I do think it has to be a bigger number. It, it has to be substantial enough to to warrant somebody not only accepting it with the gray area involved, but to say, hey, these poor other this poor buyer with the other offer, you know, for five grand, I'm gonna give it to them because they came in with a nice clean offer. But anyway, so let's say now this uh offer turns into a million twenty five. The person with the million dollar offer does not know that there was the escalation clause in the other offer, and that's how they lost on that home. Mm -hmm. How would you feel as that buyer? So that's where the gray yeah. area is because you've now inadvertently disclosed the highest Disclose. price or disclosed exactly. the price of that guy's offer. You should be right. doing the same for the new situation for the other guy. Correct. Right. So, uh, you know, and that's where there's nothing documented properly for a process. There's no proper process in place to cover everybody legally and ethically. Right. Because in a, in a real life situation, if this was, you know, in, in play, you would... Yeah. Like, it's so stupid. It's just so stupid. And I think there's parts of the world that, and we've seen maybe the odd one here or there in this country, but there's parts of the world where they sell homes by way of auction, right? The, the realtor or the I brokerage. I think Australia is one. Australia is one of the top ones that, that do it. They do it very effectively and it works well. And you know, the whole process is essentially the same, but when it comes down to the bidding war, quote unquote, as we know it here, uh, it's an auction. So everybody knows, everybody, you know, it could be on Zoom, right? Get everybody in a Zoom room here. All right, let's start the bidding. And, right. and then it's full disclosure. Everybody knows what's happening. And I, you know, I think that's a really above water way to do business. Um, 
I, you know, I, I don't know why you wouldn't go to that kind of system because in essence, that's what's happening in right now, most of Canada. Right. Most homes are seeing multiple offers. Yeah. And and so it's being done just in a different way. So I, I think a lot of people are advoc the a lot of the people that who are advocates for that method, because there's people talking about that in Canada right now. Yep. Um I think they are advocates under the premise that like some of them are are saying it because they feel like people are paying more money than they should for houses or right. you know, they don't like the, the, they don't want people overspending necessarily. Like the, the top offer was 20 K over than the second best offer. They shouldn't have had to pay that extra 20, whatever. I don't think it'll improve uh, in that scenario because if you've bid a million then the next person goes, I'll pay a million 10. Well, the person that spent a million and initially had a cap of a million, maybe now they say, well, you know, I know it's only 10 grand more. So now instead of having to just pick an arbitrary number out of a hat and hope that I work out, I'll spend an extra 15. So now I'm five grand more. Well, then the next guy says, oh, I'll spend another five. And when does it end? Right? Like that is a true bidding war. Like now you, now you may be more inclined to spend more than you had initially planned to. Yeah. There's been many times I've been to auctions where I was bidding on an item and ended up spending more than I had budgeted for or seen the value of that particular item. Yeah. That's, you know, you get in the heat of the moment, right? right. But, but ultimately, if here's the thing market value is determined by, what a property sells for and a property will only sell for as much as somebody's willing to pay. Okay. In a non-auction scenario in what's again, known in the province of Ontario as a bidding war or multiple offer situation or offer night, or I'm holding offers on this day or until this day, you potentially could have a buyer that buys your home for a million dollars and the next closest offer was 900,000 bucks. Right. Yeah. So you could be overpaying because in that scenario, if the next closest was 900,000 and you paid a million, what is the market value? Yes, technically it's a million. But if you went back onto, you got the keys and you went back onto the market next week because you had to resell it, the closest to the value of what you paid for it was $900,000. So what's right. the value, right? In, yeah. in a auction scenario, you now see that there are other bidders going up to that level. So market value has more um substance when you consider the fact that there are other other people willing to pay almost as much as that right right yeah, yeah. i'll pay a little bit more to get it but at least i know there are other people in line to pay almost as much so the one it thing not like taken in the, the one thing not taken into account with that scenario where that you give that hundred thousand dollar spread is there were probably people who didn't participate in the offers because they didn't think they stood a chance to buy it and then when they see it sells for a million they might have been like i would have paid that so in the scenario of doing an auction you'll probably have more people coming to uh i don't say to the game but more people will come to the plate with an offer because it doesn't hurt to see where the numbers go. And right. then maybe then you get two or three people that would have spent that million. And then it gives you a better indication as to what the pool of buyers believe value is. Well, exactly. And well, you know me, I, I love going to auctions. I, I very much miss not being able to go to auctions during this whole COVID time. So it's been probably two years. Well, yeah, probably two years since I've been to one. Yeah. And since the kids were born, you know, my auction times have gone less and less. But I used to go a couple of times a week. And um, and what happens when you get a, a good item is you'll start out with, you know, 20 bidders for this item 
in in the third of the bidding, right? So you have an item that would retail for a thousand bucks. The bidding starts at 50 bucks. You'll get people, you know, 50, 100, 150, 200, whatever. And then as the price goes up, bidders drop down. And then you're left with the serious ones that are battling it out to uh, actually win the item. And, you know, anyways, escalation clause is no form of that. I thought you froze there. <laughs> it was funny. It just all the sound stopped on my end, like even the my, white noise, my, and you stopped moving. My, it's my dramatic pause for you. <laughs> uh, so having this escalation clause is no, there, there is no auction. There's no, you know, it's, it's totally, um, it puts liability and, and risk and, and great, waters into this transaction and with the market values you know and where they are and for most of the country we're talking about on average a million bucks or i don't know what the average is across the country but it's it's up uh the whole country is up year over year like 20 something percent um i wonder and I haven't given this too much thought, but I wonder if what would happen if in this scenario you have two offers and both have escalation clauses in them. So now escalation clauses get so popular, right? Everybody thinks, oh, I'm a genius. I'm going to put an escalation clause. It means we're going to get this property or have the best chance at getting this property. And offer number two also thinks the same thing. So you now have two offers, both with escalation clause, both that say, we will go $25,000 than the highest bid. Right. Then what? It's, uh, it's <laughs> like, there's no scenario where it benefits anyone but the seller. And oh, well, what well, is, even, even, even then, how do you do it? Well, I would, I mean, as a seller, like, representing the seller, you got to cross it off. I would say first and foremost. So you, you're not, you don't get in trouble for anything. Well, you're not, you're not even crossing it off because you're not signing it back to the right. buyers. Right. So you're but just I going mean, back to the buyers and saying, we're not, we're not looking at your offer with an escalation clause. Yeah. Please resubmit. But what if, what if you grossly, as a buyer and a buyer's agent, what if you grossly underestimated what someone's prepared to pay for the house and you don't put a stop limit to what you'll pay? You just say, I'll pay 20 grand more than the highest bid, but you grossly underestimated the value of it. Let's say by $500,000 which is not unheard of in some markets. And now you can't afford to pay for it. Well, you know, I'm sitting here at my cottage, cottage country, and your sister-in-law has uh, seen some of that up in the Huntsville, Muskoka's, uh, Muskoka areas. Um, cottages are on fire. Homes with pools and cottages are what's, what pot right now yeah and and i've seen and you've seen because you've been watching the cottage market a bit i've seen cottages listed for like 600 grand selling for over a million bucks yeah you know when i two years ago that six hundred thousand dollar cottage was probably four hundred thousand yeah so now all of a sudden you're paying whatever million dollars for a piece of property that you didn't think was worth anywhere near that. I don't know. You, and then if you do have that cap on this clause, you're already disclosing what your, your top offer is. And it's a vicious, vicious cycle. I'm wondering why, because you mentioned on TikTok, it's been, um, yeah, you know, gaining traction. There's been traction, like we we're members of a lot of um, realtor groups on on Facebook, and we interact with lots of realtors all the time. And it has been up for discussion a lot lately. And I'm wondering what what is setting this off? Is there just more more of these clauses being inserted into into deals right now? And when well, um, I I saw recently, actually this weekend, I was looking at some listings up in. Uh, 
cottage country up in Muskoka. And one of the listings there, which was a local real estate agent in his description, in his brokerage remarks, uh, stated that they will not accept an offer with an escalation clause. So I think, I think this is coming. And now we get a lot of people from the city helping buyers in the country, right? Um, so I think this is stemming from the downtown areas where it's like a hot, very competitive market. And those agents are now obviously working in areas outside of their normal, uh, we'll say geographical area, uh, because they get people buying further outside of the city, whether to live well, or for. I think for... that's a good point because I, I think cottage country could be in for a, an awakening with these clauses because if you, in your scenario, you've got a, a buyer that's got uh, a property in downtown Toronto and they're like, oh, I can work virtually now. I've got to get out of here. I want to go live on the lake. And they put offers on a few different places because there isn't a lot of good waterfront properties that come up. So when you lose out, it, it hurts. Well, and a lot of those uh, agents and, probably and don't you really lose, know the value. They don't know the value, right? Or they don't care. They're like, right. wow, I'm selling Buddy's condo for 1.5 million or I'm selling their semi-detached home off of the Danforth for 2 million bucks. Uh, they want to buy this cottage for a million. They lost out on a couple. We're not losing out on this one. They told me that they have to have this cottage. So here's an offer. We don't want to lose it. So we will pay you fifty thousand dollars more than the next highest offer. Well, that's how it plays it's out. Probably gonna. They're yeah. like, I, I don't know what it's worth. It I I don't know that market well, but you, this is how yeah, this is tell, how we make it you happen. You tell us. You yeah. tell us what everybody else's offer is, and we'll pay more than that by fifty grand. How does that sound? Right. You know the funny thing is that Murky those conversations. Waters. Yeah, those conversations have happened to me where I have yeah. a, another realtor call me up and say, uh, can you, can you just tell me, you know, how much more yeah. we need to be, or what is, what is the other highest offer? Or, like they're like trying a, to get information and see if I'll slip up. Right. I'm sure that's happened to you and happened yeah, to everybody on our team. Yeah. You know, um, you never know what kind of information you're going to get, I suppose. But anyway, so, not a clause that we're going to be using. Uh, we're probably going to see it more in the marketplace. It is a topic of conversation right now. Um, I'd be curious, like for all the realtors that watch and listen and follow, if uh, if you've used it and you've used it successfully or poorly, I would love to hear um, any kind of feedback or um, any insights to both sides of the equation. Did you use it as a buyer's agent or did you receive some as a seller and what was I'm always curious as to what the client's experience and what, you know, at the end of the day, I don't, I don't really care about the realtor's experience. I care about what the client experience is like yeah, and making sure that, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to ruin a reputation in a business like this. And, uh, you know, you want to do things reputably, uh, professionally, ethically. Um, and I think this, this just brings gray waters into an area that it's not needed. Agreed. And I say we end on that. Good place to end. For those of you listening, thank you. And for those of you who leave comments, I appreciate it. Take, if you take an attend, uh, 40 seconds to leave a comment on the podcast, let us know what you think. Um, very much appreciated. Thank you very much. I'm going to put uh, a end date to our restaurant gift card giveaway from two episodes ago. So if you yes. haven't listened, um, what did we title that episode? Top restaurants in Milton, something like that. Top restaurants in Milton, something like that. Uh, go back and listen to it. Sorry, watch it on It was either YouTube. 129 or 130. Yeah, I think it was 130, but could be right. Anyways, uh, Top Restaurants in Milton, it was podcast two or three podcasts ago. Uh, if you go onto YouTube and comment with your favorite restaurant in Milton, Ontario, 
uh, we will be doing and the draw for favorite a restaurant and dish. And dish, yes, you're right. Yeah, if you recommend a restaurant, you got to recommend uh, a yeah. dish. What are they known for? Um, what are they known for? You know, it's funny. After that podcast, I ended up uh, listening to it back. I'm like, oh, that sounds really good. And I ended up at Casa Americo. Nice. Picking up some food. Yeah. Anyways, uh, nice chatting with you, my friend. Uh, I got to, the plumber should be here anytime soon to figure out why we don't have water. Uh, you know, if you're thinking about buying a cottage, I got lots of insight for oh, are you. you using your, be- are you using your compostable toilet now? No, that, that that toilet still has not ever been used. It's five years old. That whole that whole outhouse, I call it an outhouse. It's a it's yeah. it's, it's a bathroom. It's a two piece yeah. bathroom yeah. Uh, next to the bunkie, and it's quite nice. You know, nicely finished. Um, the toilet is a Sunmar composting toilet. One of the better composting toilets it's it's pretty impressive like i had to i've never used a composting toilet myself um but you know the the product that you put inside of it and the way it works and and all of that it's it's pretty interesting the way these things operate um i'm just a little bit freaked out about pulling out this drawer with all this crap in it right like yeah you have it's it's composted poop right and then what do you do with it like so where are you pooping now you're talking to- people say you have no plumbing in, in the, well the the plumbing is connected oh, okay okay it's just not we don't have water so i'm going down with buckets oh, to the you lake dump it in and i dump it in the top right okay uh so the toilet is not the problem the problem is washing dishes right um so I'm bringing buckets of water up from the lake because we use the lake water anyway. So I'm just going down with a bucket. It's not coming up through the taps. I'm just going down with the bucket and filling up the sink and filling up the uh, toilet and you do it manually. Right. But yeah. uh, certainly, certainly if, if, if the kids were up here, like if the family was up here, I wouldn't be able to manage, but yeah, I'm going to go and, uh, Visit with the plumber. He should be here any moment. You have a great, uh, a great day, a great week. The sun is shining. The we're almost in June. Can you imagine that? Uh, still in a lockdown. Can you imagine that? Don't talk about Real it. Real estate is on fire. Uh, Enjoy the know. rest of your time up there. Thanks for listening. To episode one thirty two. I, I, I don't know when I'm coming back. So well, if you're there much longer, can... I'm going to come join you. I I don't know how much longer I can take. It's uh, it, it's good to a point, but then you get a little stir crazy. And I haven't really relaxed because during the day I'm I'm working in the real estate life, and then you know once I put my computer away, I'm uh, doing repairs and things like that. So there's there's no, no shortage of uh, things to do. But anyways, have a good one. Thanks for listening. Thanks for following, and we'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye.